Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly Bishop Sermon on this sixth Sunday of Easter. I do pray that you're keeping strong in these challenging times and that our scriptures today might prove to be just what you need to hear to sustain you for the week ahead. And so may the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It was the summer of 1995, and our three-year-old son, Sam, was travelling to the railway station with his aunt, Kerry. Have you ever been on an intercity train before? Kerry asked her young nephew unsuspectingly, to which Sam replied, no, I've had a very sad life. And it's one of the commonest characteristics among young children that their feelings, often very strong feelings, are never far from the surface, that they wear their heart on their sleeve. That can be sweet and endearing, providing us with a host of funny anecdotes for their later lives. It can be sad and heartrending, or deeply embarrassing, as Tiny Tim chooses the very worst moment, perhaps an already stressful trip to the supermarket or a visit to his granny and grandpa, to let rip with a toddler tantrum to beat all toddler tantrums. But whatever the context, it's generally not hard to discover just how a young child is feeling, with their happiness or sadness, their anger or anxiety written all over their faces. As we grow up, of course, we generally learn to gain some control over, over our emotions, or at least how we show them, whether by unconsciously repressing them, which Freud taught us may only be storing up trouble for the future, or by channeling them in positive or negative directions. But whatever our age and maturity, our genetic makeup and upbringing, emotions are here to stay. And how we deal with them will largely determine whether the course of our lives is positive and resilient or painful and resigned. It's a deeply relevant theme, of course, during this time of COVID-19 lockdown, even with the advent of a marginal loosening of the restrictions that we're all living under. For 2020, is proving to be a year of heightened emotions. Fear, perhaps, anxiety, frustration, a sense of powerlessness, with each of us and our households affected, if in subtly individual ways. There may well be more positive emotions for some of us too, particularly in the midst of this beautiful springtime. But seldom has the question of emotional resilience been more relevant than it is today, for all of us to an extent, and most especially for those of us who are on the front line of this battle, against this dreadful virus. And as we look at our lectionary readings today, and especially those passages from the book of Acts and from John's Gospel, chapter 14, there are many themes that we could focus on. But the one that has leapt out of the pages at me has been a call to harness our emotions. And the stronger the emotions, the stronger the need to harness them so that we can use them for good and not allow them to trample all over us. The Greeks had a word for it, the word preutes. They used it of harnessing a wild horse and bringing it under control. They used it of pulling in a sail to harness the power of the wind. And when we read this word in the New Testament, it is somewhat surprisingly translated gentleness. Jesus calls us to come to him in our weariness and to learn from him because he is preus, gentle and humble in heart. St Paul instructs us, let your preutes, your gentleness, be evident to all. Because a true gentle man or gentle woman in this understanding is not aristocratic, certainly, is not a weak person, a little mild or tepid perhaps, but rather someone who has learned to harness the strongest of emotions so as to use that strength to build up, not belittle, to love, not seduce, to liberate, not to manipulate. In Acts chapter 17, we find St Paul walking around the most pagan of all pagan cities, a place dominated by sophisticated philosophy on one hand and blind superstition on the other. 
And as the Apostle started out on the Athens tourist trail, here's what he noticed in verse 16 of our chapter, that the city was full of idols, or as the Greek literally puts it, was swamped with idols or smothered with idols. Idols were everywhere, on every street corner, in every square, above every shop, wherever you looked. On the Acropolis, for example, there was a statue of Athena, the patron goddess of the city, 30 foot high and constructed of gold and ivory. Nearby, there were similar images of Apollo, of Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, Bacchus, Neptune, often beautiful statues carved by some of the greatest craftsmen of the ancient world. One Roman satirist of the time wrote that if you wandered around Athens, you'd find it easier to find a, a god than a person. So that's what Paul saw. But how did he feel about it? In verse 16 again, we're told that he was, quote, deeply distressed. The Greek word used is paroxino, from which we get our word paroxysm, used of a seizure or an epileptic fit. It's not that Paul literally had a fit, but there was something about these idols that created in him a sense of the deepest revulsion. That here were human beings giving to these wretched statues the honour and glory that was, true, that was due to the true and living God himself. So what should he do with the strength of all that emotion, with the revulsion that only grew as the tour went on? The following verses tell us that he didn't simply leave the city in protest as the good former Pharisee that he was, tut-tutting his disapproval as he went. Instead, he started to argue, to debate, to share the faith with all who would listen. And one thing led to another, and it wasn't long before the Apostle was called to face the so-called Areopagus, the Supreme Council of the city, a city that was governed not so much by politicians as by philosophers. And so here in Acts 17, we have the only sermon recorded in the New Testament addressed to a non-Jewish audience, to a people who, despite their intellect, had never read the Bible who hadn't a clue about the Messiah, whose culture was a million miles away from anything that Paul was used to. And as he faced up to this enormous cultural divide, gentle Paul harnessed all the depth of his emotion and used it positively to proclaim Christ in a way his audience might begin to relate to. He didn't quote the Bible at the council because they'd never read the Bible. He didn't talk about the Messiah because they never heard of the Messiah. He didn't mention that Jesus had died for their sins because the idea of someone dying for sin was completely alien to them. Instead, he took a visual aid from the streets of Athens, an altar that he found with some words inscribed on it to an unknown God. And he started to preach about a God who could be known. A God who made all of creation, a God intimately bound up in the lives of his people, giving them life, breath and everything else. A God of history, of destiny, of relationship, of intimacy, of judgment, of resurrection. For good measure, Paul even quoted one of the Greek poets whose lyrics were very well known at the time. In him we live and move and have our being. The poet was talking about the Greek god Zeus, but Paul courageously reapplied the lyrics to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this speech was never going to have the same impact as his speeches to the Jewish people, at least not an immediate impact, because the Athenians were so much further back in their understanding. But while some sneered, especially at Paul's talk of resurrection, others showed real interest and a few, we are told, began to believe, including one really important man, Dionysius, a member of the council who is mentioned by name because it seems that later he went on to become the first bishop of Athens. And what of our Gospel reading today from John chapter 14? Again, a story of heightened feelings as Jesus met with his disciples shortly before his death and used one of the most emotionally charged images of them all. In verse 18, I will not leave you 
orphaned. Jesus had come to mean so much to those rough men gathered around the table with him. They had left everything for his sake. And now he was about to leave them. In fact, in a sense, to leave them twice when we consider the events of Good Friday and Ascension Day with that joyful resurrection morning in between. Here we're not talking about the revulsion of St. Paul wandering around a city smothered with idols, but we are talking about the equally raw emotions of an orphaned child. Grief, bewilderment, anxiety, anger. To which Jesus responded with words of the deepest comfort and reassurance. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. So how can I be a true gentleman or gentlewoman? during these strange times, harnessing my heightened emotions to look outwards, especially at those who worship an unknown God, if any God at all. That is the Acts 17 question that challenges us today. And the John 14 question is likewise, namely this, how can I be a true gentleman or gentlewoman during this strangest of times, harnessing my heightened emotions to look upwards? and inwards, deepening my trust in the living God and opening myself to his spirit afresh, outwards, upwards, inwards. Here's a verse that didn't quite make it into the Bible, but it might have done. Be gentle, just as your Father in heaven is gentle. Be gentle on others, be gentle on yourself always abiding in the one who is gentle and humble in heart and in whom you will find rest for your soul. And whatever the emotional roller coaster of the week and weeks ahead, may Almighty God, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, bless you and your loved ones and keep you now and forever.